Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for coming to this uh, special anniversary event to celebrate the 120th anniversary of the uh, publication of Studies on Hysteria. Uh, my name is Tim Nicholson. I'm a uh, neuropsychiatrist, uh, so that's a psychiatrist with an interest in the overlap with neurology um, at the Maudsley Hospital and at King's College Hospital, the, specifically the Institute of Psychiatry uh, down in South East London. Um, so we've got a very interesting talk today um, and this is a great collaboration that uh, Ivan from the Freud Museum has sort of plotted with me for a while uh, as part of a public engagement campaign, as part of my research projects which are into um, a hysteria or a conversion disorder or functional neurological symptoms as it's now known. Um, and, and so the aim of this uh, is to specifically try and engage the public and people of affiliated interests in this disorder, which I think is a very important and misunderstood disorder. Um, and Freud is obviously uh, one of the key names in the history and still captures the imagination of everybody throughout the world. So um, this has been funded by the National Institute of Health Research, who fund my research. So that's the NHS research wing, essentially. Um, and I'll just give you a quick outline of, of what, what we're going to be going through today. So, so there's a couple of lectures, um, the first by me, and then the second by uh, Professor Rachel Bowlby, uh, an English professor who uh, writes the introduction for the current uh, Penguin edition of the book. Um, and then there'll be a break, um, and, uh, and then there'll be a debate about the relevance of the book to the disorder as we now know it. And we have a, a brilliant panel of international experts who are here today, um, and uh, I'm very grateful for them all coming along, uh, and they will be there's a mix of professions within that and obviously Freud was a neurologist who then became interested in psychiatry and founded psychoanalysis but um, uh, we have a mixture of psychiatrists, neurologists, uh, psychotherapists um, and all in between uh, to, to sort of pick the brains of. Okay so, uh, so I'll just move on to, to, to my talk now which is about a brief introduction to hysteria itself okay. So um, during this I'll be covering what hysteria is our evo the evolution of our understanding of it and the terms uh, that we use, um, how it's diagnosed, uh, and then a bit about how it's treated, and then a little bit, a bit about the current controversies within this disorder um, that will be brought out later during the, during the debate. Okay, so hysteria is essentially, it's quite simple to define in one way, which it's, it's neurological symptoms that aren't due to neurological disease. And that sounds a bit of an oxymoron. Um, so the symptoms could be any neurological symptom, so, but the most common ones would be weakness, so paralysis, uh, but also seizures, tremor, sensory problems, and almost everything in between. The, uh, the mechanism, so if it's not neurological, what is it? And this has always been a bit, you know, over history, as you'll see, this has been debated a lot, and it's still a, a, you know, a very active debate at the moment. It's generally assumed to be psychological, but that is certainly not something that you know, uh, uh, we should take for granted, at least in the, in, the, in the simplistic sense of what we see as psychological. Now, what's important is that this, has been, this disorder is now established as very common. Uh, it's not some sort of tiny niche disease of interest or historical curiosity. It's a very common disorder, and Alan Carson, one of our speakers here, is one of the people who've really nailed that in the last few decades, and it's, it's of incredible importance to those of us in the field that that's been established. Um, so if you look at a neurology outpatient clinic, about 10% have the full diagnosis. If you take a sort of looser approach about whether their symptoms are completely explained by physical disease, it gets up to about 30%. So that's a vast amount of people, and it's as common as MS or Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's also very severe. It can um, result in equal levels of disability and chronicity uh, of disability as MS and other neurological conditions, and this can often be forgotten. Also, it's very highly stigmatised, firstly with the label of a psychological illness, as we all know is sadly very stigmatised in itself, but the other major problem over and above that is the disorder is often mis misinterpreted by everybody across the board, that's doctors, nurses, patients, and often by carers, as possibly being uh, feigned or at least under <coughs> conscious control. And it's important to understand that this isn't the case, uh, and we'll cover this a bit more later on. And also it's been very neglected um, since various heydays of interest in this. It's become, for various reasons, sort of <coughs> gone off the radar of medicine a bit. And it's thanks to Alan Carson, John Stone and others who've really revamped this as a serious and important condition uh, to, to investigate. So just to go through the terminology, so hysteria is the term that Freud used in his, in his book with Breuer, obviously. 
Um, and uh, this is a term that's been around for thousands of years, in fact, since Hippocrates. Uh, and this was because uh, it was thought to be a female only condition at this point, and it was thought to be caused by the womb wandering around the body, somehow affecting the nerves. And it seems slightly crazy now that this is still, but it's, it's bizarre that it was only in the last few hundred years that this has become uh, relatively put away as an idea. Um, and in fact, even as late as 1910, uh, in the UK and the US, people were performing hysterectomies and oophorectomies, so removing people's uh, uteruses and uh, ovaries in order to cure this disorder. And this was quite scary, it's almost just about 100 years ago, and after the publication of this book. Um, so things have moved on, but it's been the pace of change has been incredibly slow. Another just important, we've obviously been covering things quite briefly today, but the, um, the other key term that emerged uh, from Charcot in Paris uh, in the sort of late 1800s was that this is a, not only just a brain disorder, but it's a brain disorder where the structure of the brain is normal. So this coincided with the time that microscope, light microscopes were first becoming able to look at pathology of the brain. And there was no abnormality of the brain, so people thought this is a disorder of function rather than of structure. And this, this, this term has been, remained reasonably popular, but it's been sort of given a new lease of life in the last few years, and now it's one of the official terms for the disorder, and probably going to be the official term uh, from now on. <clears throat> um, the other contribution of Charcot was that he particularly used hypnosis as a method of, uh, of treating the disorder and also creating si analogous symptoms through hypnosis. So you could somehow create similar symptoms. And it's, that's, again, carried on being popular as a mechanism and as a model for this disorder scientifically, uh, even at this current time. Uh, and the final um, term, obviously, that we need to think about <coughs> is conversion disorder. And this is the term that Freud didn't, uh, wasn't the first to use, but he was the first to popularise. Um, and he also came up with several other uh, key contributions to the field, which I'll, I'll cover in, a, in the next slide. So, as mentioned, he, and within you know, uh, studies on hysteria, uh, he has said that we adopt the term conversion to signify the transformation <coughs> of psychical excitation into chronic somatic symptoms, which is so characteristic of hysteria. And he proposed the central role of psychological stresses, um, and that they would be revealed and cured by psychoanalysis and free association. And we'll hear a bit more about this uh, in, in due course. Um, there were other <coughs> key concepts which he came up with of repression, so repression of memories um, out of consciousness. And a couple of other topics which still have, you know, widely used by psychiatrists and people in the field as well, of different forms of gain, particularly secondary gain. So there are two types of gain from symptoms that, that Freud proposed. Primary gain was the actual process of conversion, so a sort of psychical, psychological problem. <coughs> the actual transformation itself into physical symptoms is somehow uh, reduces the, the affect or the amount of stress of that, of that stressor. And the secondary gain is that the resulting physical symptoms uh, are somehow beneficial to the patient in reducing the stressor. So um, being in a wheelchair or having a physical symptom somehow reduces the stressor, uh, so it makes someone's wife less likely to leave them or, or they would stop being bullied by someone at work. So this is a concept that Freud um, proposed and still has some sort of currency today in psychiatry, I think. So... The 20th century was a bit of a, a bad time. Um, neurology and se uh, psychiatry separated. As we know, Charcot, Freud were sort of neuropsychiatrists, but they had sort of neurology training. But as the disciplines diverged, um, it, became a, it, it sort of fell between different stools, the, the disorder. Uh, and there were this uh, gentleman here, Elliot Slater, who you hopefully can see a little bit, he's published in uh, 1965 an influential paper which uh, said that... Uh, hysteria or conversion disorder is a snare, a bit of a, a misdiagnosis. If you, if you make this diagnosis, patients will often end up with a physical health uh, disorder. And, uh, and this, was, this was sort of put back research and clinical effort, I think, into this disorder quite badly. Um, and it's only until the work of Alan and others that we've really <coughs> established that this isn't the case, that the, <coughs> the diagnosis is actually stable over time. So... I think towards the end of the last century and into this one, I think we're seeing an enlightenment of sorts and that we actually know how common and important this condition is. So the current diagnostic criteria, um, so for those of you who are not clinicians at all, which is the majority of you, uh, DSM-5 is the uh, American version of psychiatric classification criteria. Um, and just as of in the last two years, it's updated every decade approximately. In the last edition, 
the terminology has changed from uh, conversion disorder to conversion disorder or functional neurological disorder. So as you'll see, this is a functional neurological disorder is an increasingly common term used for it. So you need the neurological symptoms, um, so the paralysis, the numbness, the seizures, and that's sort of obviously your primary essential criterion. Um, and then it needs to be not explained by neurological disease. So the MRI scans are normal. There's no disease that can be found that can explain the disorder. But what's critical, and again, Alan and John and Stone and others have been in critical in this, is, it, is refocusing um, to the importance of it not being explainable. This used to be in the footnotes, but it's now a, an essential criterion. So this, it's not only that you can't find a disorder that's causing it, that it's sort of different, there's something unique about it. And this is why the diagnostic certainty comes from, that you can be positive about what you're doing, not just finding what it's not. So I'll go through this in a, little, in a bit more in a, in, a, in a while. And also critically, and importantly for this debate, is that the essential criterion of finding a stressor has been removed. It used to be that you had to find a psychological stressor around the time of symptom onset to make the diagnosis. But that's been removed because in, in most studies they haven't been able to find that in all patients. Uh, and the other thing that's been removed, which is, which is important, is that you used to have to actively exclude feigned conditions, so uh, um, malingering, which is essentially uh, uh, or factitious disorder, which is essentially producing the symptoms uh, for other gains, so it's a consciously generated symptom. And there are sort of theoretical natural problems in doing that, so that's been removed. So this key thing about whether it not being explainable, um, so there are a couple of components to this. Um, the first is that the symptoms don't follow the normal rules of, of anatomy and physiology and are generally thought to conform to an expectation of disease rather than what the, the neurological system will do when it's damaged. So, for example, uh, if somebody has a, a loss of sensation in their arm, rather than it fitting what we call a dermatomal distribution where the nerves are wide, it's actually the, the sensation will change around the groin crease or around the shoulder. So it'll be about expectation of disease process rather than the physical rules of, of the wiring of the nervous system. Um, and this has led to a common problem, as I've mentioned before, about this disorder being uh, misinterpreted as uh, consciously generated because consciously generated symptoms have these same <coughs> features as well. So uh, this led to quite an astute observation by Paget uh, in 1873 that the symptoms, um, the patient says that I cannot do something, I cannot move my arm, it looks like I will not, but as I cannot will, I cannot generate movement somehow. So this is where the sort of model of hypnosis is quite relevant in understanding if, if, if you're hypnotised, you really can't move something. So it's tapping into the same process, but it looks, and the symptoms can look like they're, uh, they're consciously uh, simulated. So um, as an example of, uh, of this, this is um, a gentleman from uh, the, the shell shock, which was a specific outbreak of, um, uh, of uh, hysteria. Um, <laughs> Uh, that occurred obviously of, you know, following the horrors of trench warfare, which we could all equate and understand of how that's such an incredible trauma. Um, and there was such a, uh, uh, such a problem with the amount of, uh, uh, of soldiers suffering from this, given the extreme stresses and trauma, that, uh, uh, that the whole, you know, whole hospitals were set up, military hospitals. This is a big hospital down in Netley, down in, in, in the Solent, uh, which was set up to deal with it. And there's literally hundreds of pe pe people coming here. And it was a crisis for the military recruitment. But just so, you've watched this a few times now, but um, <coughs> this is him, uh, he's dragging his leg. And essentially, if you have a weak leg due to a stroke or some other problem, you tend to sort of circumduct your leg, so you'll move it around. You won't sort of drag your leg. So this is how, uh, this is what someone's expectation of a weak leg would be like, rather than it necessarily being uh, what the leg would be like if you damaged the nerves uh, per se. Um, and at this time, they obviously boast of an amazing treatment, which unfortunately has never particularly been uh, substantiated ever since. But, uh, <laughs> um, but there was, you know, we, we, we joke about it, but there were, it, it was quite, there were quite, you know, not in the UK, thankfully, but there were quite barbaric treatments to try and sort of pressurise people back to the front line and make them make recoveries at this time. So, um, and another thing that's, oops, uh, uh, that I, I, apart, apart from not obeying the rules of an, uh, anatomy and physiology, is that it's a, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference in symptoms in that the conscious um, performance is worse than the unconscious performance. So when someone's trying to do something, it's harder than when they're not doing it or doing it reflexly or automatically. 
Um, so uh, the, uh, sort of the thin end of the wedge for this is for people, sportsmen who are not very good at, you know, when you're under pressure to kicking a penalty in the World Cup final, you'll, do, you'll be much harder when you're really trying to do something there's a lot of pressure on you than when you're actually just doing it reflexly. Um, and this is found clinically uh, through a thing called Hoover's sign if you've got weakness in the leg in that um, the patient here will be trying to um, ask to push down with their right leg onto the hand of the clinician and they won't be able to generate much force. But if you keep your hand on that leg whilst asking them to push up on the other leg, it creates a reflex uh, increased power. And this used to be a bit of a, a trick that clinicians would use to catch pa patients out, particularly uh, clinicians who didn't think this was a serious condition. Um, but now it's uh, used as a sort of way of showing to patients, this is why we know what you've got, because obviously the biggest problem for patients often is, you know, you found what it's not, what, it, what is exactly is causing my paralysis. And also it's used to show that there is a potential for recovery. So in twofold, you can get a really good outcome from using this test and that you can show that, uh, and this is something that Mark Edwards, one of the uh, lecturers here, has really pioneered. So I think this is a great twist on something that was usually seen quite deceptively, but is now used very positively. Um, so just going through the current treatments briefly before, before I wrap up. Um, uh, at the moment, one of the first things is just to, ex you know, it's a key, it, it sounds quite a simple thing just to explain and reassure, but that can be um, a very biggest part of what we do. And people have, have often been treated in, in very variable ways before they get to see a clinician who understands and takes this disorder seriously because of this problem of looking like it's something that can be consciously generated. Um, so a lot of that is, take, is listening to all the problems people have come to you with and explaining the condition. And everybody's got a different background or understanding, so it can be quite a long and difficult process to get to that. And it's intuitively bizarre that physical symptoms can be caused by psychological mechanisms, so it can take a while to get to that place. Physiotherapy is a key part of treatment as well. It's probably what, you know, one of the key things we do at the moment. Psychological therapies have sort of become a bit less part of the frontline treatment and generally reserved for when things don't quickly recover or get stuck. Um, people can also be sedated, uh, not only to show that the symptoms can move, but uh, historically um, these were used to sort of uh, to, to get to the psychological trauma, as Freud would, would, would postulate that was present in, in most, if not all, patients. Um, and finally, hypnos hypnotherapy is still used, but intermittently. Um, so at the moment, I think we, we, we know that we go, we work our way down this list at the moment, but it's, it's quite it's, at the time of Freud, it, the list was the opposite way around in terms of the treatments that would be, would be given. Um, so it would generally hypnosis, and as obviously as we'll hear, this is, that sort of morphed into, into, into sort of psychoanalytic approaches when hypnosis wasn't possible. Um, and sedation, ab reaction, so trying to get out stresses through being sedated, um, either through hypnosis or through, uh, or, or through drugs. Uh, and then uh, these other components were less part of what, what we did. And obviously it's important to, to, to understand how that's moved. So we've got, we've got our current sort of controversies that are still within, within the disorder. Um, we don't, it's not really entirely clear how often psychological traumas or psychological mechanisms are actually found. Uh, and that's sort of a currently sort of quite a uh, reasonably big debate. And even if we do find one, how do we know it's relevant to the disorder? We all have stress in our lives. Uh, particularly at you know, uh, uh, certain times. So it's hard to tell whether it's relevant. Not only to the mechanism, but also is it relevant to the treatment? Is it going to help treatment to know the, what the psychological stressor is that might be involved in, the, in symptom generation? And this, this begs the bigger question of, is the disorder actually psychological? Uh, and if not, is there a better explanation? Uh, and, and if it is, is it just psychology under the microscopes when we're looking at, you know, in this, in this day and age of understanding how the brain works through uh, functional imaging, is it just that this is psychology under the microscope rather than something other than psychology? And that's something that's very, again, a big debate. And this, this obviously brings up the question of how relevant is Freud's pioneering work to the disorder as we now know it? And this is what we'll, we'll talk about in due course. So uh, we'll come back to the debate uh, later on, but... Uh, um, we've got a, uh, some time for questions now, so we've got about uh, any, any thoughts or questions from the audience about the disorder, and I might recruit some of the panel members if, if it's something I'm less clear about. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that's... What do I mean by psychology under the microscope? I think, I think that's the fact that the, dual, the inherent dualism between neurology and psychiatry is that if there's something you can identify wrong with the brain, that that's neurology. 
uh, and if it's something sort of more ethereal, it's psychology or something that's a, you know, higher functions in the brain. But as we now understand the interaction between higher functions and lower functions, that becomes a bit of an artificial um, uh, uh, issue. And, and I guess it's if you're reframing, you know, if, we, if we're trying to work out what this disorder is and we're thinking, is it not psychological? Then it's what is it? So, and I think it's really that can get quite messy when you're looking at uh, brain dysfunction. And, and, it, and I think it just makes the distinction between neurology and psychiatry evaporate, really. But it's really that, you know, it's just different ways of looking at brain function. Why do you think it was first thought of as a, as a female disease? And is there still some gender imbalance in people presenting symptoms? Yeah, that's a good point. I think, uh, yes, it, it, it's, it's thought about, about four to one females to males. Um, so it's not on, because the disorder is relatively common, it's not an uncommon thing in men, but it's certainly much more common in, uh, uh, in, in women than men. There's no, there, there aren't really any good theories as to why that is. Um, uh, so I think that, that, that that's something I, I find interesting. There are some, there is some recent quite interesting work in, in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. That are certain genes that are uh, uh, that are sort of similar or genetic differences that are only found in females that make them more predisposed to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and the way that the, uh, the, the the body's sort of stress system interacts with with trauma. So that's a potential theory, but nobody's really got any way to explain why it, you know there is this. You know, a big, big difference because it is, it is a big, you know, important thing. And you know, uh, but at the moment, obviously, it's it clearly makes the whole theory seem you know, crazy about a uterus. But back then, you know, people didn't seem to find it in men. Sorry, Alan. Yes. Can I make a comment? Yeah. On that, uh, just in the, the, the uterine, the uterine hypothesis was clearly accepted widely before the start of written medicine. It begs the question why, but in that era when people were talking about hysteria, there would be a very wide gamut of what might be somatoform symptoms, so things like irritable bowel, chronic fatigue syndrome would all be included. And I was writing a review of this historically for my thesis at the time my wife was pregnant with our first child. And although she clearly didn't have conversion paralysis, she had most of the symptoms of bowel upset, fatigue, back pain, and memory disturbance. And my own naive thought on the topic was that people were watching these symptoms due to a moving womb inside somebody and their reversibility afterwards. And it didn't seem a large leap in logic to me to think, well, maybe that's how it's happening, that this womb is, is moving other people. So I, I'm not sure if it's quite the naive and daft theory it's, it's thought of now, although it's completely wrong. But I, I think there may have been a more benign explanation of where it came from. It's just my own pet theory. No one else believes it. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, at the back, yes. Oh, sorry. Could, do you mind waiting until we've got the microphone here? Thanks. Uh, I just want to ask what the um, research is that neurological disorders such as MS can be triggered by stresses and therefore mm. treated psychologically. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think a lot of, I think this is a very interesting area. I think, you know, when, when that's why the data, when you look at, the amount of you know because the historical assumption was that everybody with with this disorder had stress that, that had precipitated it, uh, but then when you look at physical disorders that, that clearly aren't psychological, uh, they're a physical disorder, but they can be precipitated by stress. It sort of shows the interaction between stress and bodily function, and I think this is where you get to the, uh, quite an interesting discrepancy because I think most for most people it's in, it's quite intuitive that stress can cause. Uh, physical disorder or harm. It can cause a stroke, a heart attack. Most people don't have a problem with that. Um, but it's when you say it's the only problem or the only cause, particularly when that's combined with the stigma of having a psychological diagnosis. And people misinterpreting psychological to mean that it's somehow a weakness or under your control. Um, but the, when you get to the data, um, uh, one of the, the comparison groups in, in a, one of the, the few high quality studies that have looked at stress, the sort of method for looking at you know, which gets actually finding stress sort of rigorously scientifically is actually quite a complex thing to do. Uh, MS is, you know, there isn't a, quite a big association between stress and MS, uh, both coming on for the first time and relapses as well, and there, as there is for most physical health disorders. I'm asking because I have MS, yes. but also because mm. going through, uh, I'm now a psychotherapist, but going okay. through 
Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, and what's also very, which I haven't covered here, but I think it's relevant, is that you can have both a physical disorder like MS and uh, conversion disorder or functional neurological symptoms as well. And that's actually quite common. So the same for epilepsy, the same for stroke. You know, uh, some estimates are sort of 10 to 20% of people can have th that on top. So it can be exacerbating or even totally new symptoms. So people can have seizures that are due to epilepsy, but seizures that are due to conversion disorder or functional seizures as well. So that gets quite complex uh, to understand as well, but it's, it's sort of fascinating how it all fits together. I think you might have just answered the oh, answer okay. my question. Yeah. It was like sort of like fibromyalgia and chronic pain. And, yeah. You know, in, the, in pain clinics, it's not an either or anymore. You know, it's, it's quite accepted that psychological and physiological symptoms combining and treated in that way with both psychotherapy and physical treatment. Yeah. So I, I just wonder if that either or distinction is as relevant. I, I don't think it should be, but it is. I think if you go to most clinicians, they tend to sort of think of thing, things as either physical or, or psychological. And I think we've got a vast amount of work to do within health professionals to, to understand this. Um, people might have had good experiences where that's not the case, but I think when you follow the, the journey of patients with this disorder, it's, it's, it's very far from, from accepted, um, even amongst professional groups, psychiatrists and neurologists who deal with these disorders. But I think these other conditions are sort of similar, yeah, where there is a... And I think it's just helping break down that artificial distinction between the body and the, and, and the mind. Mm.